Hey guys, welcome to my Full Moon Friday series, where I talk about some of the Full Moon features from my personal collection. Now, if you aren't familiar with Full Moon Entertainment, it is a long-running production company known for releasing cult horror movies like the Puppet Master series and other direct-to-video cult classics. They were popular among B-horror fans in the 80s and 90s, and Full Moon still operates to this day and still has a cult following, although I would say the quality of movies has declined. If you are already a Full Moon fan, this might be a fun blast from the past for you. If you're unfamiliar, this, these videos will kind of help you get started with some recommendations. What's up guys, Eli here, back for another Full Moon Friday. Uh, got a pretty good stack of movies, I think five or six, something like that. Uh, I might split it up into two videos, I'm not really sure yet. But anyways, we're going to start off with, well, not a bang. Maybe the opposite of a bang, maybe like a, just a little, like a, a little bit of air. Um, not, not good. We're not starting off great, is what I'm trying to say. Uh, and we're starting with Casino of the Damned, also known as The Haunted Casino. Uh, it came out in 2007. Uh, it was directed by Charles Band, which is typically not a great sign beyond the early days, but uh, I digress. So it stars Wes Anderson, uh, Wes Armstrong, sorry, not Anderson, <laughs> not Wes Anderson, Jesus Christ. Wes Armstrong, Kristen Green, uh, and the legendary Michael Berryman, and Sid Haig, so I should say the legends, Berryman and Haig. Um, and despite those two guys being on the cover, uh, they're not really in it that much, which I chalk it up to probably budgetary constraints, which I understand. So here we have Matthew, for some reason inherits an old decrepit casino after his uncle passes away. I guess maybe he was the only family member, I don't know. He, along with his girlfriend and a few close friends, decide to go check it out and figure out what it will need to be restored for reopening, only to learn that the joint is haunted by the ghosts of former employees. Much like Demonic Toys 2 that I talked about, I think, in the last video, uh, this movie has a decent start, considering its budget, and the first few minutes overshadow the rest of its runtime, in my opinion. And the characters here really do no favors. They're all either completely uninteresting or completely unlikable. Uh, especially the spiky-haired pop-punk dude and his girlfriend who admittedly hate each other. None of the characters really add anything at all to the movie, despite uh, Sid Haig and Michael Berryman's best efforts. Best efforts? Yeah, I get, they, they were pretty good. Uh, even the ghosts are boring, so much that even horror icons like Sid Haig and Michael Berryman can't really save it. Uh, Dominic Muir's script was terrible, so I suppose these people didn't really have much to work with. He did write Critters as his first ever screenplay. I guess we'd call that beginner's luck. The visual effects were also awful. Lazy blood spraying that looks like nobody even tried and some instantly dated looking CGI. So now that I've gotten all the negative aspects out of the way, uh, what good can I say about it? Well, nothing really. The pacing could have been worse, I guess, <laughs> because uh, the only good thing that I can say is that I wasn't completely bored. So I'm going to go ahead and give Casino of the Damned a 3 out of 10. What do you guys think? Has anyone seen this movie? I can't imagine many of you have. Next we have Island of the Fishmen. Island of the Fishmen came out in 1979, the same year that Tourist Trap would come out under the name of uh, Charles Band's Productions. Uh, Charles Band Productions. And uh, four years before Band started, full, uh, started Empire Pictures, the precursor. To full moon uh, this selection may be seen as a bit of a cheat since full moon only released this movie on blu-ray in 2021 and didn't have a hand in the movie's creation but it's got the full moon logo on it so i decided to include it as a bit of a wild card island of the fishmen is an italian film directed by sergio martino of torso fame you might have heard of torso it's kind of a uh, kind of a cult classic slasher movie uh, it is sort of a loose adaptation of the shadow over innsmouth by hp lovecraft and maybe even Island of Dr. Moreau by H.G. Wells. So this is a total rubber monster horror movie and uh, kind of like a, I would say creature from the Black Lagoon fans might really dig this. The creatures here, uh, I think they look kind of cool. Um, they look, you know, they're painfully obvious uh, as just being, you know, rubber costumes, but uh, I kind of like them regardless. There's a scene where the island tribe perform a ritual where they kill a chicken and being an Italian movie, I expected it to be real. Luckily, it didn't look real, and the blood didn't either, so I give it some points for that, believe it or not. Um, for being a uh, movie from 1979, it has more of a 50s or 60s feel to it, uh, especially when you see the monsters. 
Um, this movie is pretty engaging and actually looks pretty nice with decent cinematography, mostly solid professional acting, and I'd give it a soft recommendation you know, to fans of 50s monster movies and Italian cinema in general. Um, all in all, a decent, if uh, flawed effort, I give it a 5 out of 10. What do you guys think? Cra, the sea monster, was released in uh, 1998, even though watching it, you would swear it was from the early 90s or even the late 80s. Uh, and for that reason, I feel like it's more enjoyable now than it probably was 25 years ago or whatever. As were back then, it probably seemed instantly dated. It now has that kind of retro vibe of a movie like Psycho Goreman. What's missing, however, is the gore, because this 69-minute movie is rated PG. A full moon movie rated PG. So back in 1996, Charles Band put together Monster Island Entertainment for the sole purpose of releasing kaiju-type monster movies. Uh, pretty cool idea, at least I thought. It wasn't very successful, however, only lasting two years and two movies, the other being Zarkor the Invader, uh, released in 1996. Now, this movie has a ton of flaws, but it's mostly fun, and if you grew up watching Power Rangers or something like that, you might actually enjoy this. The movie starts with Lord Doom, who's kind of like the Skeletor-esque villain of Proyas, the dark planet, uh, scheming and sending Kra, the evil sea monster, to rid the Earth of all humans. I mean, I can't really fault him for that. Lord Doom uh, proceeds to damage the Planet Patrol headquarters in hopes that uh, they won't be able to stop his attack on Earth. Now, the Planet Patrol are basically like a super lame version of the Federation from Star Trek. Even lamer? No, I'm just kidding. I like Star Trek. Uh, the actors all look like high school students and seem to have zero acting skill. Fortunately, a Planet Patrol officer named Mogyar... Mogyar? Yeah, I think his name is Mogyar. is on Earth, and he's Earth's only hope for some reason. I expected Mogyar to be human like all the other uh, officers that you see, but instead he's like this tiny alien creature that looks like something Jim Henson would create. He, he kind of looks like Oscar the Grouch. He has this stereotypical Italian accent and is, honestly, he's very cute and likable. Uh, at around the six minute mark, we see our villain Kra rise out of the ocean. How he got there doesn't seem to matter. Uh, Kra looks ridiculous and cheesy, but I, I don't really care. I kind of like him and he gives the movie kind of like a 60s monster movie feel. So, can Mogyar and his Earth friends defeat Kra and save the planet? You'll have to somehow, for some reason, watch the movie to find out. So again, the acting here is terrible, and I'm pretty sure one of the actors plays two different characters. If Mogyar had a bigger part, I'd rate this a little bit higher. I'm going to go ahead and give Kra a 5 out of 10, which is probably more than it deserves. But uh, at 69 minutes, it's not a boring movie at all. I could recommend this to fans of old kaiju movies, but that's kind of about it. Oh, and maybe Power Rangers fans as well. Now we're going to talk about Tourist Trap, uh, kind of another wild card, uh, because Tourist Trap was released in 1979 via Charles Band Productions, which was his pre-Full Moon company. So I guess you could argue with me, say it's not a Full Moon movie, but I'd argue back and say that it kind of is. Uh, it was directed by David Schmoller, who would direct the first Puppet Master movie, along with a slew of other things. He wrote Tourist Trap with the help of J. Larry Carroll, who wrote for a bunch of popular cartoons in the 1980s. Uh, I love Schmoller's creativity in this movie, um, and I love how you can see shades of Puppet Master ideas that would come years later. I also get vibes of horror classics like The Hills Have Eyes, Motel Hell, and Texas Chainsaw Massacre which, oddly enough, J. Larry Carroll had a band in producing uh, five years earlier. A hand, not a band. <laughs> he had a hand in producing it. Uh, for me, there's nothing quite like a filmmaker forced to be creative with a small budget, and especially when their work kind of overshadows like bigger budget productions. So in Tourist Trap, you have Mr. Slauson, played by Chuck Connors, as an insane roadside attraction owner with telekinetic powers in which he uses to lure people to be killed by his mannequins and puppets uh, controlled by his powers. And that's pretty much the plot, uh, which for 1979 is very cool and very creative. There are some plot twists showing just how crazy Mr. Slauson is, and he steals the show here along with Schmoller's army of creepy puppets. This movie is a cult classic and might even be better than Puppet Master, um, I should probably mention the PG rating, though, 
because I have no how I no idea how it got a, a PG rating, especially since there is some blood uh, in an early on scene in the movie. Uh, shouldn't that demand an, an R rating just just for the bloody scene? I know things were different back in seventy nine. I gotta say I, I really like this movie. In fact, I kind of love it. Um, I think Mr. Slauson is an all time great horror villain and brings a lot to the table as far as how he kills his victims. And the fact that he seems to maybe not really know that he's insane, uh, evil maybe, but not crazy, and that's kind of what makes him so dangerous. I'm surprised that Charles Band didn't turn this movie into a franchise, which is something he would do a lot with you know, his full moon stuff. Uh, but I think we can all agree that it's probably better as a standalone film. Now, I guess the question I'd ask you guys, is Tourist Trap a slasher film? I'm not really sure, but I, I guess so. Um, I know some people call it that. Uh, I'm going to give it an 8 out of 10, the highest full moon score thus far. All right, now we're going to talk about Netherworld, which was released in 1992 and was directed again by David Schmoller, who I mentioned earlier uh, since he directed Tourist Trap and Puppet Master. It was written by Schmoller and Charles Band together. Now, I haven't yet seen everything David Schmoller is directed by, but I am... I'd say I am a fan of his earlier work. So here we have Corey, who just inherited his father's property, which sits deep in Louisiana. Little did he know what he was in for, let me tell you that much. <laughs> he certainly didn't expect to find detailed instructions from his dad in which to be resurrected. Corey ultimately finds himself surrounded by black magic, his father's ghost, and a mysterious woman. As it says on the box, there's a place between heaven and hell. The movie starts out very Roadhouse-esque, complete with a bluesy rock band playing at some backwoods bar where, of course, a fight breaks out. Uh, bonus points if you notice that Edgar Winter is the main guy in the band for some odd reason. The bar is attached uh, to a mysterious brothel where you can see escorts wearing creepy masks that will remind you of Tourist Trap, and I guess you could say is one of David Schmoller's trademarks. It's a cool touch, and I do like it. I also get Phantasm and Lord of Illusions vibes very early on, which is not a bad thing. Corey makes it out to his father's estate and meets the caretakers of the property, who all seem odd and seem to dodge questions he asks about his father, which he mentions that he really didn't know very well. Uh, the premise of the story seems very Lovecraft to me, except for sex being so prominent. And as we all know, old Howard Phillip was not comfortable with that kind of thing. The flying stone hand thing that isn't really ever explained much uh, is aping Phantasm a bit too much, but the first kill scene, which is actually the only kill scene in the movie, uh, was super gruesome. So I'd say, well done, Mr. Schmoller, on that. At about the halfway mark, the cheesy elements kind of really start to take over, and that brings my score down drastically. I liked the mysterious bird people thing, and I would have been cool with more of that, but for me to enjoy this movie fully, the cheesy elements just have to go. The acting is pretty competent, the characters are all decent and fairly interesting. Uh, for me, this movie is part Stephen King, part Don Coscarelli, part Clive Barker, and part H.P. Lovecraft, but without reaching the greatness of any of them. I'm going to go ahead and give Netherworld a 5 out of 10. I wanted to score it higher, but I just can't. Anyways, guys, that's it for... Uh, uh, today's uh, episode of Full Moon Friday. Let me know what you think about these movies, if you've seen any of them. I hope you're all doing well. Louis says hello, and we will talk soon. Uh, fucking cheers.